Uh, good morning. I would like to welcome once again uh, all participants to the Central European Higher Education Conference who have been here since yesterday already, but I would also like to welcome uh, all other guests who are here uh, for the book launch. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank CU Press, our editing house, for uh, taking care of the uh, logistics for this, uh, for this event. Uh, we had a very interesting discussion yesterday and also uh, today as part of our uh, conference. And uh, some of us might think that it is uh, somewhat unusual to have a book launch as part of uh, higher education uh, regional conference. But I believe this is very interesting and it fits very well. And it is interesting because uh, we have we are going to talk in a moment about a very special uh, book written by a very special author. I had a chance to uh, introduce him yesterday and I will say a few words today as well about the author. We will discuss about the, the book in, in a moment. So uh, we are talking about uh, Jonathan Cole's book, Toward the More Perfect uh, University. You will be able to uh, buy uh, the book outside and I can turn for a moment in a fin financial advisor and I can tell you this is a very good investment. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan will also sign uh, the book so in 20, 30 years from now the price of the book will go uh, up astronomically <laughs> once all the reforms that he envisages in the book will be implemented in, um, in, in particular. So, uh, yeah, this is the previous. That's the previous one. So uh, it's out of uh, out of stock already. Um, so Jonathan is currently the John Mitchell Mason Professor of the University at uh, Columbia University. Uh, he has he served as Provost of Columbia for 14 years. There is a rumor that he started his tenure already in the 18th century, but that's not true. It was only from uh, 1989 to, uh, to 2003. Um, he served a very long and distinguished career at Columbia University, but what is perhaps even more important for us here is that you know, he has the, the stature, of, uh, stature of one of the most uh, uh, relevant uh, thinkers uh, of, uh, of uh, higher education, not only a scholar but a thinker. And after reading this book, I think I can also say a reformer of, uh, of, uh, of higher education. Now, uh, this book is explicitly about the great American university, which is the title of the, of the previous book, and how to, to make it uh, even better. So uh, you may ask, why discuss uh, an American university subject at a conference about uh, higher education in uh, uh, Central Europe? And we will really have such a discussion, and this is the, the challenge I am posing to Jonathan. So I am joined here by two colleagues, uh, Gergely Kovac from Corvinus University, which is our partner in uh, co-hosting this conference, and Alesh Wilk, who comes from the University of Life Sciences, the Czech University of Life Sciences, I have learned it uh, in the end. But, um, you know, it was the, the idea behind this initiative, having a book launch uh, with an American subject here. Uh, so the, the idea behind this is somewhat controversial. It is my idea and I am uh, happy to take the, the blame for it. What Jonathan is discussing in his, uh, in his uh, book is uh, a model of university or perhaps the model. And we are talking about, cha when we are talking about challenges in this part of the world, about trends, about possible solutions, almost always we come back to the American research university as, as a model. So that is something that is very important for, uh, for us. And you know, uh, what Jonathan is doing in his book is to explain, perhaps in ways that nobody has done it before, why is the American research university a great institution? And he does this going beyond what many of us think we know, and when I say many of us, I mean uh, higher education scholars, uh, university administrators, 
politicians, but also the general public. So there, there is a lot in, in, that, uh, in that book that uh, uh, explains what this university really is beyond uh, myths, for example. Jonathan is also talking about challenges. What are challenges to the um, research university in the United States? Both external challenges and internal challenges. What are imperfections of this uh, model and also dangers? And that is very relevant for us here as well when we are thinking about our own universities looking, uh, looking at this uh, uh, model. Of course, many will contest that this is a model or it should be a model for us in, in this part of the world, but this is something that, uh, that we can, uh, um, we can certainly um, uh, discuss. Um, I think I will, I will stop here with, uh, with um, uh, this short um, introduction. Uh, many, many things to, to say. This is a, a very consistent book almost 400 pages. Uh, you know, uh, first I thought, why would someone write a, a book with this title and that long? But after reading it, I think I, I understand. And perhaps I will say one, one other thing by way of introduction. Obviously, Jonathan Cole is not the only one who is writing about uh, you know, the American Research University, about uh, higher education in general. There are many books. What these other books do usually is celebrate the achievements of the American Research University or lament, or both, as a matter of fact. Both celebrate and, and lament. And what is very unique here is that Jonathan comes up with solutions, recommendations. And this is, in a way, what makes the book longer than uh, the similar books on, on this subject. And there is a tremendous amount of very concrete uh, recommendations. Well, I, I was thinking to make this comment a little later, but I'll make it now and then I'll stop uh, and uh, you know, uh, ask Jonathan to make a short introduction and then uh, our two colleagues to, to comment. This is not a, a stern book, a dry book written by a bureaucrat or an, or an administrator. It has a lot of humane aspects in it, personal stories. You know, it is a very profound book which is written by a humanist. So, you know, it is not written by someone who is a university administrator only or a scholar who is looking coldly at what, at what is happening in higher education, but it is the book of a, of a humanist. I think this is one of the, the, the most impressive aspects about it. So I'll really stop here. I uh, promise three times I will, but now I really will. And I will turn to, to Jonathan for perhaps just one, two minutes of uh, introduction. Well, if I were going to hire a publicist, um, I know where I would go. Uh, thank you for that very warm and kind and overly generous introduction. Um, I must say that uh, when I look at these books and then when I look at the book that my brother and I actually produced in 19... 73. Um, I've gotten rather verbose and old, I think, because they're much longer than they used to be. I really want to, since most of you uh, were at the meeting yesterday where I did talk about some of the substance of the book, let me just try to fill in those who were not there uh, what some of the subject matters were and what my intention was, and I can be very brief about that. This is not a book that says we must do the following things in order to keep American research universities great. It is a normative book. It is not a prognostication. Social scientists are worse than laymen at prediction. And so we try to, if we're smart enough, stay away from prediction and prognostication, whether it be on budgets, on deficits, or whatever it may be over a 30 or 40 year period. But what this book is trying to do is to rekindle a debate which existed 100 years ago in the United States about what uh, the university ought to look like when it was in its research university, when it was basically in its infancy or at least its neonatal uh, situation. So what I'm doing here is making suggestions about how I believe there can be structural and other changes within American universities to make them more closely approximate an ideal. But it is not the only set of solutions, and the idea is to rekindle debate within the United States and abroad about 
what are the elements that are required in the 21st century to make our great universities, whether they be in the United States or whether they be in Europe uh, or in Asia, wherever they may be, uh, still better than they, they are? To give you a sense of um, what the content of the book actually addresses, let me just read the uh, chapter titles and then I will sit down, uh, let other people comment, and then be very happy to answer whatever questions you might have about any of these topics or about uh, some of the uh, observations made by my colleagues uh, here. Um, I begin actually this, this book by um, addressing the issue of getting into college. Uh, as some of you know in the United States, especially at the highly selective colleges, you may have 40,000 applicants for 1,500 positions. And the question is whether or not we've gone astray in the way in which we select students uh, to be in these colleges and whether we ought to rethink the whole way in which we deal with high stakes testing and how we shape a class when we have the opportunity to shape a class so that it's optimal rather than having all people essentially look alike or very much alike. Uh, another chapter is th thoughts on undergraduate education. That is what I think uh, students ought to get uh, when they graduate from college and the question of whether or not they are actually getting value added. We don't know, for example, whether Harvard students coming in are very, very smart. They're going, uh, Harvard students going out are very smart, but we don't know what the effects of the curriculum are. We don't uh, know whether there's any actual value added of that curriculum because they don't measure it. And most uh, universities are afraid to measure it. Same is true, uh, in effect, with uh, professional schools. Um, I also uh, have a big chapter, a long chapter, on the humanities and why the humanities are essential to a university, a great university, and why we ought to bring them back in and why we ought to resist efforts by politicians in the United States and others who um, would claim that the humanities are not important for a great university. I do deal with in several chapters the issue of affordability and access to education for those who are uh, with talent but without means and why it is of great value for them to um, uh, attend these colleges but why uh, also Many of them are uh, without sufficient information to, uh, to know how to go about doing that. And then I begin to talk a little bit about creating new structures, for example, academic leagues and knowledge communities, where we take, uh, we, instead of looking at competition, we really look at cooperative strategies across universities and across nations, actually. Um, I have a chapter on reimagining the university campus. We haven't really thought about the architecture of universities for about 600 years, and this is an effort to try to rethink, especially in urban settings, what a campus ought to look like. Uh, there's a chapter on reconstructing the university government compact, which I talked a little bit about yesterday, but which I think is critically important and which is deteriorating in the United States. And finally, a set of structural changes that I think are needed at universities uh, that ought to be addressed. For example, the whole issue of tenure, the way budgets are done, governance is done, these are all addressed uh, in, the, in the book itself. Now, I wanted to just close by saying that there is an awful lot in this book that you would say is extraordinarily unlikely to uh, be implemented. And I would agree with you if we, uh, if we essentially accept what is or what we're told as given. It has not escaped my attention that if these were put to a plebiscite or a vote, a lot of these changes uh, would be rejected. But that doesn't mean, in fact, that the choices aren't there. The question is, are we going to make the right choices? And what are the right choices for the universities, but more importantly, for the society as a whole? So that gives you an overview of what the, uh, the content of the book is about. I'm happy to talk about any of those subjects as it relates to the, uh, the book. And um, it's just a beautiful read. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
if you don't have the time to read the book, which you will, you know, prepare because Jonathan is starting a radio program. He already has planned some 150, 180 episodes, and this is this you know uh, continues in a way where where you where you left it, Jonathan. So uh, what he is trying to do is not to give recipes for changes, but to stimulate a discussion. And this is done through the book here, in other places, and also very interestingly to this uh, radio show of which there is nothing similar in, uh, in, uh, in the United States. Now, I, if I may turn to our colleague from Corvinus University, Gergely Kovac. You can talk from there if you feel more comfortable. There is a microphone there. Yeah. I like standing. Good. <laughs> um, so, uh, when I first took into my hands this book, it was huge. Uh, but my first question was whether it is relevant for, for me, for Hungary, for Central Europe, for all the countries. Um, and I can say it is, it, the, the answer is yes. And why is, because, uh, why is that? Um, mainly because uh, it is uh, talking about questions and raising issues which are important for all the universities, not just the research university. How is it possible? There is a saying, it is the most intelligent fish which aware of this environment is wet. Um, and I think reading this book made me think about what kind of uh, university I would like. Uh, so what is Livio is talking about, that is provoke debate, I think it is very important and it is very um, this, full, full, this book fulfills that kind of role because this book makes me think about um, the attacks on humanities and social sciences in Hungary and how is it possible. Uh, the lack and need for stronger liberal arts and education and why it is not happening in Hungary. Uh, why we don't have uh, understanding and discourse about higher education. Uh, what is the role of consistory, a kind of board, and presidents and rectors in governance in Hungary? Uh, how we can tap the potential of university industry partnerships? Uh, what is the, why is there is a lack of focus in, in how we design buildings to foster collaborations? So, you know, Central European University is just making a building and uh, uh, another Hungarian university just making a campus, but, uh, but they are just started to think about how to design all those things so it can foster collaboration. Um, what is, the, what is the relationship between teaching and research and how to involve people uh, doing mainly research into teaching? It, shall we do that? You know, just to go back to Marek Kwiak's presentation. Uh, the over-regulation of sector, and last but not least, the problem of trust, which is very important in Central European context. So these are questions which are, which are raised in the book. There is an answer in the book, or there is a... There, there are questions in the books about that, but these are quite relevant for, for uh, Hungary, for Central Europe, uh, from Central European countries as well. Uh, I don't want to go into details all of these things. I just want to um, mention one part of the things, which is the lack of discourse about higher education in Hungary. Uh, and we think that it is a, a problem that all those uh, things happened after the change of the regime uh, there, is a, there was an expansion, there was the Bologna process, funding reforms, we have a three or four uh, law of higher education in Hungary, so there is a lot of change, and within this change, we just forget to discuss what's higher education for, because we focus on students, focus on programs, and people just do the old things, so we get, became short-sighted. We have a myopia, and we don't uh, look on the distance. So we started a project in Hungary, it is called the Future of Higher Education, uh, but instead of doing preaches, what we think as experts of higher education, we invited people from, from administration, from students, and we started a conversation with them. First, we do the system mapping, so what they think is important. And then uh, we ask the question, what kind of higher education would you like in 2050? So in 30 years now, from now. And they just started to think, so we don't uh, stuck in, in discussing the problems of today uh, and what the government and funding and things, but we started to think about the vision of higher education and the thing we, we think important. And then we started uh, coming back, you know, it's a kind of backtracking 
what shall we do to achieve that kind of vision? And I think this book has a similar uh, aspect because uh, Professor Cole um, provides us or focuses our attention on important things. So the book starts with admission and curriculum. And most of higher education books starts with governance and funding. And it was an interesting start for me that, well, the most important thing is teaching and learning. And that is which the book starts with. And I think that's a very important change of aspect uh, rather than always governance and funding. By the way, I'm researching governance and funding, so. <laughs> But, uh, but I think the import teaching and, and research is important and uh, we sometimes lack of focus. Uh, and I think the book is uh, excellent in, in focusing our attention on important things. So that's just a first thought. I think we are going to do the discussion later. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, yes, yes. It seems to be uh, very serious, so I will try to be serious well. Well, but I will be serious my own way, okay? I got an email three weeks ago that I will be part of this book launch. And they said, we will send you, we will ship you the book. I said, okay, the book will get lost on the way. It was in Prague from Budapest in one day. Miracle. Then I went with my son to the sport camp. He's four year old, okay? He asked, are there any pictures in the book? <laughs> what? Daddy, what are you having? Are there pictures? No, no, okay. I'm not interested. So I saved the book. Okay, it's there. <laughs> Actually, I did my homework only half a way through. I only had time to read half of the book. I got B plus from Jonathan. Thank you very much. <laughs> B minus? Oh, B. Still, so. My comment actually will be what are my impressions when I'm reading the book, what I think about when I'm reading the book. I know nothing about American higher education, I can tell you. And I only studied in the US for one year. I was given a scholarship by Open Society Fund in 1994. I studied there for one year. In, they asked me to go to Harvard, Yale, and uh, then the University of Arkansas paid the most, you know. So I chose this location. I don't know what I did well, but still. U of A, it's a great university. <laughs> so, but I cannot say that I know, I know anything about higher education in the United States, even though I studied there for one year. I'm not even sure whether I know anything about the Czech higher education, you know. So I cannot compare, I cannot judge anything, but I have some feelings. And uh, I have four points. First is when I read, the same is Gregory, what I can learn from that, what kind, whether I can learn at all myself or maybe the system, whether we can do some lesson drawing and, and so on. The other one, what I can learn as a teacher, whether it's, it's, and I have to admit that it's a great source of inspiration for me. The, the third point, which I will get into later probably, it's online. And the fourth one is the uniqueness of uh, the university education in, in the future, in, in the past. The, the thing which I want to stress probably just at the beginning is the, you, you start with the, with the American education and the first thing is teaching and learning. What's interesting in Central Europe, more and more we say, we stress the research function of the university. And we kind of tend to forget about teaching and learning somehow, especially when you open the web page of the Charles University, you read the first research, research, research. And some people do not have time to teach. They do not have time to get ready for the classes. So somehow, due to the research, they have been omitting the teaching. They have been forgetting about the first mission. What I like about the American system, about the book, that they, it's coming back to this first mission, which has been here for all the history, which is, which is the most important thing. And the, the second thing at the beginning, I think, even though this is a university, this is academia, it has different features in different countries. I have the same feeling in Germany. We usually go to Eastern Germany and say, this used to be a part of a communist regime, you know, used to be communist. 
you go there and say, okay, this used to be communist, but still, it's Germany. That's different. Still Germany. And the factor that it's Germany, it's more important than it's a formal Eastern Bloc. When you go to the Czech University, it's a university, but what's more important that it's still it's Czech. And I can see the differences, you know. So I think when we talk about the university, it's a specific part of each society with some common features, like soccer league, like for example the government, you know. It's, we, we, we have some features, something which is common, but it's different in each country. So that's how I'm reading the book. I was, thank you very much for actually letting me read the book, because otherwise I probably wouldn't read it at all. I got it for free, thank you. It's not that bad, okay? <laughs> The only thing which I've been missing is the signature, but we can, I think, do it. And I, I know I, I will do my check, don't worry. And uh, it's a great inspiration. I will get, get into it, uh, you know, later on. So, thank you. Maybe I can, I can just, sure. I can just one thing, you know. I was reading the book and it's, it's a story for me. It's a story about American higher education. It's a nice story and it reminds me back. And I was waiting and I thought, I have to ask Jonathan about the online courses. And on the train here, I found the chapter, chapter six. It's here. Okay, excellent. And I was reading it and what's impression that you are talking about online thing, but still, you don't, I, I wouldn't say that you don't believe in it, but still it's, it shouldn't change the whole thing and we should go back to the roots and use it just as a, as a tool because we shouldn't abuse it, we shouldn't overuse it. And I read the book really because on page 155, A minus. <laughs> because I was, why should we preserve the, the campus? And it's, it, the, the answer is right there, and you know the answer. If nothing else will save the residential college, sex will. <laughs> so this is page 155, and it, it's so here. Right the yes, yes, yes. So I read the book. <laughs> okay. Let me say a few. Uh, let me say a, a word or two about uh, online education, because that is a, a matter of some interest to many people. And it was, of course, uh, touted uh, several years ago by Sebastian Prune and various others who were uh, leaders uh, as a disruptive form of uh, uh, mechanism that was going to put an end to the bricks and mortar of the modern American uh, research university. Uh, there are two reasons why I think that is not true. Uh, one is uh, that um, a great deal of research cannot be done online. You have to, if you t take the research elements of a university, there's so much that goes on interpersonally in the laboratory, the nature of these spontaneous uh, interactions, the serendipitous finding, etc., that you cannot get uh, as easily, certainly, through uh, online mechanisms. But if you're looking simply even at teaching, I go back to uh, what Woodrow Wilson said many, many, many years ago, when he was president of Princeton, he said, you know, most of the learning that goes, takes place at Princeton, at least, uh, happens after the faculty go home. And when the students rub minds against minds. And uh, I think that's still true in many, many ways. It's, uh, is, there is what one learns in the formal curriculum and then what one learns in the informal. So what I do in this chapter is discuss ways in which technology is always, has been, and is still capable of improving the quality of education, as I think a lot of the new platforms will, and I don't mean Coursera necessarily or edX, uh, which have been built at Stanford and which have been built at Harvard and MIT, um, and many universities have joined that. Um, but really platforms that have been built by individual faculty members in the study of science, etc. Uh, 
I think it can improve the quality of education, and it may be able to reduce to some extent uh, the cost. But I don't think it's any substitute for bricks and mortar and the interaction, the conversations. Read Sherry Turkle's new books uh, about this. They're quite wonderful by someone who was a very AI, uh, artificial intelligence oriented person for 25 years. But how important she realizes now interpersonal relationships are, and what is lost if we, uh, if we give way to that. One final comment on uh, online education. There was great hope, and I still think there is great hope, for online education having a democratizing effect in the sense that there are people around the world who cannot go to some of these great universities, but would benefit enormously by listening to lectures or discussions by people who are actually located at them. Uh, the, thus far, the trouble has been that the people who actually have access to these uh, online courses or online discussions or seminars, etc., in nations in South America and Africa and various other places are already very well educated. In other words, it's not really attending to the needs of those people who are not already well established and well educated. And we have to learn a mechanism for establishing that. And then I think it can have a, a democratizing effect. It can also have an effect, as I suggest, in creating academic leagues of bringing together uh, strength with strengths. People at CEU who are strong in a subject can actually link up with people who are very strong in the same area, like, uh, as I was saying yesterday, quality, inequality of income and wealth, uh, who are working in France and England and the United States and other places, and can actually have online seminars in real time that will uh, allow people in one setting to enjoy and benefit from uh, the insights of people are very, very bright in this area, but are working in, in fact, in different countries. John? Uh, yeah, I want to thank you, Jonathan. I, I wanted to ask you to elaborate a bit on a topic that I don't think I saw in the, or heard in the table of contents. And having not yet read the book, I don't know whether it's in it, but that is international education. Um, and by that, I mean uh, there are many different forms of international education. Every university is probably today trying to attract some international students. There's a very strong initiative here in Hungary by the government to bring more international students to Hungary, which is very good. Uh, then there is the model that some uni universities in the United States are using of building uh, campuses abroad and working with foreign governments and, and, uh, and setting up uh, higher education. We have a rather unique model, perhaps at CU, which is uh, a non-national despite our very strong ties with Hungary and accreditation in Hungary. We have uh, no nationally dominant uh, student uh, group. Uh, that is to say, our largest percentage is 18% Hungarian, and then uh, 140, 130 other uh, backgrounds. So uh, maybe I'm, I'm not asking you to choose a model, but really to tell us more from your long perspective about the value of international pedagogically, socially, internationally, and maybe ending in Alej Blok's point, which is all universities basically in the end are national and there are sort of projections of their own national culture. So help us figure all well, that out. Well, let me, let me speak uh, again from the American uh, perspective, which is of course the one that I know the best. Uh, there are increasing flows of students around the world. Uh, they are the United States basically has one industry with, which probably has the greatest favorable balance of trade, and it's called higher education. Uh, the flow of students and, uh, and faculty members who want to come to the United States is great. And as I was saying yesterday, um, this is 15 years ago when I did an analysis of the country of origin of the tenured faculty at Columbia. Uh, it turned out that 43% tenured faculty were either born or studied in other countries before they came to the United States. Now many of us also are um, almost requiring our undergraduates to study abroad. 
I think the United States does that very poorly, quite frankly, and probably has done better by other countries. And what I mean by poorly is the experience of studying abroad, abroad is extremely important. Uh, learning about other cultures is very important. But it seems to me very, very difficult to learn about other cultures if you don't know their languages. And the American system, if it fails in one way dramatically, it is uh, eschewing uh, the study of foreign languages. In the book, I talk about the need to go back to the study of foreign languages as part of the humanities. And, how uh, we might not get into a lot of international trouble if we knew a little bit more about the cultures and languages. Um, but uh, the fact of the matter is these students will go to France and hang out with other English-speaking Americans in Paris. That's not the experience we're looking for. On the research frontier, I, I take basically not an NYU approach, which is to build campuses in Abu Dhabi or to build them in, in Singapore, because uh, not Singapore, uh, in uh, Shanghai, Shanghai. Um, because I am absolutely sure that if, it, if the Shanghai University ever becomes a, a really distinguished university, which it won't until academic freedom is, is, uh, is really internalized in China, but if it ever does, that'll be the end of NYU's presence there. The Chinese are not going to allow NYU, Shanghai, to be their major university and contribution to the great university world. However, I do believe that in a slightly faster pace than Darwinian um, or, or Procrustean or whatever uh, you know, metaphor you would like, I believe that uh, globalization is happening. And all one has to do to have evidence of this is to look at um, science and engineering indicators, which is a volume that's published every two years by the National Science Board of the National Science Foundation, which has an incredible, incredible wealth of data on publications, on citation patterns, all the kinds of things that you were talking about. And if you look at the trajectory of papers that are published with scholars from multiple nations, it's been growing up very dramatically. So strength searches for strength. And if strength can be found at CEU, and uh, there's strength at Columbia in the same area. Those people are going to seek each other out and very well may collaborate on papers. And they might have an impact, and they might not have an impact. It may just be self-citing, but who knows? You know, they might actually discover something. Um, so my view of it is that this is a natural process, and that we ought to facilitate that process. But we shouldn't try to artificially stimulate it in a way that is being uh, taken on by many where I have doubts about what the outcomes would be. I don't know if that answers your question. I have two other colleagues on that. I, I thought, you know, uh, Alex introduced a very good strategy for the discussion. Pretend you are a student, right? You know, one should be <laughs> careful or tolerant with, uh, with students. So I am going to take that and use that strategy for a moment to stimulate perhaps more discussion. If I were a student and I were asked to summarize or present a book in a, in a seminar, and I would say the book does three things. One is to provide new knowledge through information and analysis about uh, uh, universities, higher education in America and beyond. But it also proposes concepts and heuristics, how to understand, how to explain, how to interpret. And that is very useful outside the United States as well. And it also puts forward Calls, suggestions for, for a recommendation. I want to be able to say very briefly the, the first two, the kind of knowledge, new knowledge that the book provides. And sometimes Jonathan does this by some kind of uh, constructive deconstruction of myths, if I could put it uh, that way. And that, that is fascinating to, to read. So he mentions, for example, that it was the public funding that made American <coughs> private research university great in the end, which uh, I have never thought of, but you know, what in Europe when we say American research university, we always think and also say private research university. And you know, we forget about how this happened after the Second World War and to what extent public funding contributed to make this university great. And uh, Jonathan goes forward and, was, and mentions suggestions about how this system should be review, reviewed and, uh, and revised today. Another myth which speaks not for the scholars, 
but for the public more, is that, uh, uh, or the reality is that there is no ranking of students at admissions. So when Columbia gets 46,000 applications, they are not ranked from the first one to the four and four to six thousand one. It's a lot more complicated than that, in a way more random and also less equitable than one would think. And it's very interesting because we in Hungary are obliged to have a ranking, a formal ranking, and even send together with a rejection letter, send a kind of explanation why the student was rejected and where is he on the list. Or uh, Jonathan is saying in America this is a myth, but it doesn't happen like that. And it couldn't happen and it shouldn't happen as a, as a matter of fact. And it's very interesting. I think I, I cannot explain here and make justice to his proposal. He mentioned the lottery, for example. If you hear a lottery at admission and you haven't read the book, you will think this is not serious. But it's very, very serious and very, uh, and very profound. He also talks about the fact that the current model of American research university is a product of the 30s and 50s, and it might not be actual. As a, as a matter of fact, or many aspects of it uh, need to be, to be reconsidered. So there are many other aspects like that. I, I'm not going to summarize all of them. I wanted to give one example about the, uh, the, the you know, heuristic tools that uh, Jonathan is not only proposing, actually using in, in this book. And he talks a lot about the compact between uh, universities and, and, and the government. And uh, this is also a very complex concept. I thought after reading this book that we can, we can discover something very interesting that is happening in our part of the world by using this, uh, this concept that I mentioned it yesterday briefly, as I said. Now, there was a kind of compact after the fall of the communist regime between national authorities, governments, and universities in the way that universities were considered part of the national project, national program. They were accepted, even invited to articulate what kind of country do we want to be? Romania, Hungary, Poland, and then do it. Actually, it happens beyond Central and Eastern Europe alone, but this was very, very clear. So they were accepted, invited. There was a consensus. There was a compact, almost a social contract. Now that is changing. And we see government saying it's not the job of universities to participate, to formulate a national project. We are going to do it. And the universities have no role in it. Or they have a subordinate role, they just have to implement. We, the government, are going to decide which university can teach what courses. And you know, only one university in the country can have political science, for example. This, this, this is a, a little bit of an, of an illustration of what I meant by the heuristic tools that uh, Jonathan is proposing, applying them also to, to, the, to the American uh, context, frankly. I think I have seen Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Mark, Mark and Gillies uh, from uh, Britain or, or Australia. Um, I just want to follow on your last comment and going to say, can you think, Jonathan, of a place in the world at the moment where government and university um, connections are getting better, where the compact or the contract or the contact, whatever you call it, is actually improving? Because we've heard four times already in this conference different parts of the world where it seems to be in decline. Is this the biggest challenge in the end to the university as we know it? Well, that's a superb question, and I don't know that I have any really good answers. I haven't explored it fully. Um, I think Canada, perhaps, if everyone goes to Canada, right? Uh, when in doubt, go to Canada. Uh, I'm, I may after November. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in, in, any, in any event, um, I think that this is a major problem. Uh, you know, and let me give you an example uh, based upon a congressional committee that I was uh, on this past year. In the United States today, first of all, let me preempt. There is no such thing as a public or private university. It's not a dichotomy any longer. The University of Michigan gets about six cents uh, of every one of its budgetary dollars from the state of Michigan. That's it. All the rest comes from either private funding, um, gifts, research contracts, maybe you know, medical practice plans, whatever it might be. Uh, Columbia is not a private university. Harvard is not a private university. Stanford is not a strictly private university. It's governed privately, but its dependency on the government for funding is huge. I mean, 
when I left the provost office about you know, now almost 15, no, 12 years ago, <laughs> uh, <laughs> hair wasn't totally white. Um, we have an annual operating budget, not capital budget, but operating budget of over three billion dollars a year, and at least half of that came from public sources. And so this dichotomy of public-private is, is not real. And in fact, the government has enormous leverage over universities if it wants to exercise it. Now, after the Second World War, as I said and suggested yesterday, there was tremendous trust which grew up between the universities and the government because of what science had done, mostly science and I should say technology and engineering, did to help win the war. I mean, it's not just the atomic bomb. It was, you know, the improvement of radar. These things that took place at MIT's Rad Lab and places uh, all across the country. And so the, the universities were these places that were looked up to, basically. Uh, leading university figures, James Conan, for example, the president of Harvard, would have his, his face on the cover of uh, Life magazine, a look magazine as would someone like Vannevar Bush. No, you won't see that any longer, whatever magazine you happen to be uh, looking, looking at. But there is an old famous line from Emil Durkheim, the sociologist, who said that, you know, all of the important elements of the contract are the non-contractual elements in the contract. That is to say, all of those things which aren't written down, but which involve trust. Really. If trust breaks down, regulations are going to be used by government to control universities. And in the United States, this is what we're looking into in the, in the Congressional Committee, there is now over 4,000 regulations directed simply towards controlling research at American universities. Now what this means, as I suggested yesterday as well, is that if you get a grant from the NIH 40% of your time is going to be spent on bureaucratic work, filling out forms, rather than doing science. What is lost for the nation in that process? And most of this is regulations to control. And they are unfunded mandates. And the government is imposing it on the universities to do it with the threat of withdrawing funding if they don't do it. Um, and in fact, what this does is drive up costs, and then the government can, complains about the rising cost of education in the United States. So the, the real tough question, I think, is as trust declines, if it declines, between government and universities in this social compact, how do you gain it? And one of the most difficult sociological questions once you've lost the trust of people, how do you regain it? Mrs. Clinton is going through just this kind of issue, where the, the public, for whatever reasons, don't have a very high level of trust in her, for whatever the reasons. How to regain that trust is an extremely difficult thing to do. How universities regain the trust of the government so that they deregulate them to some extent, and still allow them autonomy and allow them to criticize the government. That is a very perplexing issue. And it, it, I don't know if you know England and Australia far better than I do. I don't know whether the same pattern operates there. But as far as I can tell, it, this is happening in a widespread way rather than in uh, you know, just a few countries like the United States. Well, let's have a round of questions. I'll start with uh, um, Professor Cole just raised the question I wanted to raise as well. It's how to create trust. Uh, and uh, just uh, to add a short note to uh, Livy's last comment as well. Um, in Hungary, uh, the admission system was reformed in around 2006. And uh, universities no longer control the admission of undergraduates. So there is a, based on their higher education, uh, on um, maturity exams, uh, it is decided whether they can in higher education or not. And the reason was that universities were excluded from the admission process was that 
it might hinder corruption. Which means the government thought that the uh, university will abuse this system and will let uh, people uh, corrupt them and let people into higher education. Uh, and it might be true. And I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an important thing that uh, uh, Central European countries is a bit different institutional setting because we are not talking about the deterioration of trust because it is a low trust country. So it is, if it is a kind of disease, we are not in the beginning of the, of the first stage, but we are somewhere at the end. Uh, and it's, it's much, much harder, much harder to create trust while we are also create a setting in which institutions can perform. So if we want a performative university which has to have performance, but at the same time, we want mechanisms which create trust as well and makes the whole process sustainable. Now that's the question I think Central European countries face. Uh, and I think it is a much different question than having in Western Europe where there is a kind of trust, or there were trust, or we remember trust. What was when we trust universities? Because in Hungary, if some, somebody from the government says something about higher education, nobody believes it. Uh, and that makes all the policy instruments uh, ineffective because they say that it's a performance agreement and we say, okay, but we, 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 are, we always think that how we can over, over smart all the peoples. Uh, and that makes, you know, it's a kind of game between the government and the, and the other part of higher, edu or, or, and higher education. Uh, it's a chess game, so, uh, but it is not about trust. And one more comment. Uh, Professor Coles talk about the distrust between government and the institution. Uh, and I think the situation is far worse. Because when this uh, situation happens, then the management of institutions are forced uh, to apply regulations in the institution itself, creating distrust within the institution as well and harming uh, mistrust uh, or harming those values which are in the book. And the first one is trust. Uh, and it is a very difficult uh, management challenge, I think, uh, how to defend the university and at the same time create trust. Um, just again an example, uh, in Hungary when there is huge pressure on institutions to adapt uh, because money is withdrawn. Uh, university leaders were in a very difficult position. How can I protect the people? How can I protect their autonomy? And at the same time, how can I protect the institution from government pressure? It's unsolvable. So it's, I think it's not, at that point, it was not solvable. We, we should search answers somewhere else. Uh, and the third comment, uh, I don't think uh, that going back uh, to, the, uh, to the concept of one hour push, uh, that the government gives us money and we're doing the basic research and in the future there will be some useful application of that research, uh, of that, uh, research. it is viable anymore because uh, higher education is far larger and there is, if the stakes are higher then there are more risk that there are people who don't, won't do that, that kind of research even if we think that they will so because the, the, the sector is larger then the risk is higher and that's that means that we should look uh, new means to create trust, but at the same time create performance as well. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, um, I'm an economist, but I would ask a question on, on natural sciences. Can you sh shed some light on the reasons why American universities are top top in, in, in science and not just one university, I can name you two dozens that are very good. Is that the selection process of the student? Is that the selection process of the professors, professors or any other structure? Or, or how important is the um, cooperation between the universities and the industry? Because I, I visited uh, many um, uh, uh, incubators houses in the United States. Everywhere they told me, for instance, the Silicon Valley, we are here, Korea, USA, 
the extent for is USSF, we are Berkeley, etc. Boston, uh, medical sciences, very, very strong, health sciences, very strong, very good hospitals. The, um, uh, uh, the triangle in Elon Duke is chemistry. So what is the role uh, of the cooperation between industries? The reason why I'm asking this <coughs> is that because some of the things we cannot in Europe in general and in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe emulate from the United States because we don't have the kind of money that goes into research of, um, uh, <coughs> of uh, exploring the universe or the, uh, uh, defense expenditure or NIH, etc. So that we cannot match. But maybe we can do something else together with the European project, uh, as I mentioned, the selection or, or cooperation with the uh, uh, industry. And how, how big a role do you play, in your view, in the United States, the center of excellence that universities start trying to establish? Well, it's a good and complex uh, question. Uh, it's really the good part of the first book has to do with what produces uh, research excellence. Uh, I don't forget about research, by the way, uh, but it's a third of this book is really about research discoveries and, and how they come from universities, even though most people don't know they came from universities. Uh, but let me attend to the question that you have uh, as best I can in a, in a relatively brief reply. And there was a time in the United States when there were independent uh, industrial laboratories that were like universities. Bell Laboratories when, um, who were producing you know, work that was Nobel Prize quality work and they were receiving Nobel Prize uh, prizes. They were, they were essentially universities that were run within, within uh, industry. But as the bottom line became more and more important um, for these various companies, uh, they basically ceded the research part of R&D to the universities and they took up the development side, which they were better at. But that required that they be close to the sources of discovery, and that is why a lot of the companies want to be near uh, great research uh, universities and have placed themselves near, whether it be in the Cambridge area, Boston area, Silicon Valley, and around New York now, uh, and a variety, of, as you say, also North Carolina. Um, so I think that that is um, part of the relationship, but I think what really um, distinguishes the United States, at least uh, in its post-war period, Second World War period, is the structure of the university and the structure of the laboratory. And the very nature of doing work inside the laboratory. Uh, first of all, there was, it was very, very uh, egalitarian. And a lot of the great scientists who came over as intellectual migrants from Hungary, from other uh, Eastern European countries, uh, all the countries that were affected uh, in a variety of ways by um, you know, the uh, National Socialist um, and the war. Um, those people came over and they had, they had lived in a, a great system of research that was very hierarchical. In the United States, it's this, the system of education is far more democratic in the sense that you allow students, graduate students, postdoctoral students, to play major roles, and they are like family, and they're treated like family. Uh, they have almost familial relations with, uh, with, with their, their professors, and they are viewed that way by the professors, and, and they have sessions where they question the professors, so it's, as I have put it, and I don't know if I mentioned it yesterday, but it's the difference between, for example, what I observe in China when I go there and what I observe in the United States. In China, we still have this sort of Confucian style of learning, sitting at the foot of a master and, uh, and, and taking up the words of wisdom and trying to memorize them, being able to feed back almost anything on an examination so you can do well at it. In the United States, it's much more of a Talmudic tradition, really, in a way. That is to say, it's a questioning tradition. It's a tradition where it's not, doesn't matter if you're wrong. 
to learn by errors. Science is failure in a way. And it, it's even promoted within the laboratories of the university, encouraged. You take chances, you take opportunities. So I think that uh, we should not, uh, it's not simply a matter of talent, it's every bit as much talent in Europe, it seems to me, even I, I think in many ways, uh, more human capital of, at, at the time when people go to uh, college than there is in the United States. But the question is, how is the organization of higher education structured in a way that's either going to facilitate or hinder the development of knowledge? And I think the United States hit on um, a, a methodology, as it were, or a mechanism for uh, being uh, a highly creative structure. And I think that's, that's part of it. It's not that they're brighter, it's just the, the structure of uh, how they organize research how they organize the efforts of research that uh, make them uh, tend to have um, uh, abundance of discoveries. I know that after hearing so much about the book, you can't wait to get out by it and read it eventually, but we will take two more <coughs> interventions before we, we uh, wrap up. My name is Istanbul, I'm from University of Budapest, and uh, I, I feel uh, discussing a book that, that we haven't read by playing darts in a totally dark room. So therefore I, I try my, my shot now. Uh, I, uh, I think that uh, this issue, the uh, changing perspectives uh, in, in certain university uh, problem areas is, is really challenging. Going back to the first session, uh, thinking of the 10-person uh, researcher heroes uh, can be addressed that 10% uh, of, of, of the academics in the university own uh, or possess 50% of the opportunities, not distributing the opportunities uh, among the wider uh, 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 public of the university. And if we consider academics, uh, they are only 10 to 20% of the, of the uh, university citizens. What about the rest? And uh, my question is focusing just by what you have just mentioned, Students, students uh, constitute uh, uh, the large majority of the human capacities of the universities, but they are not uh, managed with, uh, in many uh, countries. Uh, I think it's also a challenge for Hungary. Uh, with broader trust and sharing uh, responsibility with designing programs, involving them in, in, uh, in uh, not only in academic issues but also in management issues. Uh, my last. Uh, uh, comment on this, that, that some years ago with my students we uh, tried to uh, uncover uh, radically different scenarios of student involvement. And we arrived to the student-led, student-managed university. First we found it very weird, and after uh, some weeks we found that it's an absolutely possible option. And, and it's not, uh, not a, it, is, it doesn't mean that it's without professors. <coughs> But the students as, as intelligent clients are considered responsible stakeholders. How much do you risk? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, thank you. I think, thank you. I have a very short, uh, sophisticated, difficult, challenging, however, a bit selfish question. Okay. I am teaching, next semester, I'm teaching higher education policies. You know? Suppose I have a permission to use your book as a let's say recommended literature, okay? Which chapter would you recommend for my students? Because I know the problem is that if I want to talk about American higher education, first they have to go through one semester of American history, one semester of American culture, and one semester of American government. And then we can talk about American higher education so they can understand what's all the story about. So which chapter would you recommend? And one sentence I, they should remember from, from the book. Thank you very much. You know, I'm thinking about the students as well. Under my constitutional rights as an American citizen, I have the right to remain silent. <laughs> there, is no, there, is no single, uh, there is no single chapter, but read the first, um, because it gives you an overview. I would say, and you're quite right. Um, I wish my students knew history of uh, their own country, uh, much less having to, uh, to uh, 
worry about the history of, of, another, of another country. But I think it gives you an overview of, uh, of what I'm trying to, uh, trying to address. So um, if I can be facetious, uh, that's what I would, uh, that's what I would do. Let me, let me turn to the, the other question, um, which I think is an important one. And it's, it's, it's constantly uh, percolating. Uh, and, and you have the advantage of not having read the book, you see. Um, and, uh, and therefore, you're asking a stupid question. But it's the issue of where students, the, the role of students in the university, is always percolating in, in American universities. And I think that um, there is unquestionably a role in aspects of governance, um, in, uh, in, in the debates about ideas, uh, in even the issues related to academic freedom uh, that students have, and um, they should be part of the community in that sense, within the framework of the norms that the community uh, acts on, uh, they should be uh, participants. But I do think that if I'm going to be honest with you, there's an asymmetry. There's a reason why there is a faculty, and there's a reason why there are students, and they are not equal. I mean, you know, if they were equal, I don't know why, why not have to just reverse the roles? The fact of the matter is, faculty have a responsibility for creating, you know, syllabi. Uh, the faculty have uh, a, you know, they, they have to make certain kinds of decisions which are independent of students who are 18 years old or 19 years old. And as smart as they may be, and as helpful as they may be, and as suggestive as they may be, um, they don't have the experience of the collectivity of faculty and also those people who are administering the university. So if you call that a bias, so be it. Um, but I don't think that this, as it were, equal standing, there's equal importance, but there's not equal standing in setting out the rules of the university and how it is, how it is governed. Now, in the United States, there's a very interesting conversation going. This will be my last, uh, last comment on the issue of academic freedom. Uh, in the history of academic freedom, which is now 100 years old, really, there has been basically an increasingly expansive view of what is protected by way of free expression and free inquiry uh, at, the, at the university. It started from next to nothing in 1915 to where it expanded greatly to where the, the protections were very wide, I, I, would, I would say. Now, the interesting thing that's happened, and some of you may have read about it, is the student movement, the active student movement today in the, in the United States, to limit free expression, to actually be willing to trade fundamental rights, like privacy, like free expression, for security, a sense of community. They have to be safe places on campus everybody. And the idea that the university is a place that's supposed to be a safe haven from any uh, utterances that might be offensive for conflicting points of view, um, that it is essentially a place where one confronts one's biases and presuppositions rather than eschews them and puts them away in a closet is under debate in the United States, and it's quite fascinating, actually, that the students are leading the effort to reintroduce speech codes on campus, um, trigger warnings for books that are placed on books so that, you know, they don't have to read books which might have a word that's offensive to them, even though it was written two centuries ago. Um, you know, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's a fascinating uh, reversal, as it were, when students were always much more radical in some sense than the professors and trying to expand the limits on things like academic freedom. So um, the students play a critical role, but I don't think they can govern the university really as much. Well, as you can see, there is a lot more that we can talk about, and I hope there will be other uh, opportunities to meet uh, Jonathan Paul. Uh, but if you, know, you won't be able to take advantage of those opportunities, I suggest that you start reading the book or perhaps finish reading the, the book. <laughs> and you know, there will be copies outside. I would like to thank uh, all of you, thank uh, Jonathan Cole and also the colleagues from the, from the panel. Yeah, thank you very much.